Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I am Leo Flowers. Welcome. It's, uh, it's January 21st, 7 p.m. It's a Friday, and I've been clamoring all day to talk to you. I'm so excited that you're here, I'm here, and we get to be here together and share and what I want to share with you today at this very moment, because let's all take a big exhale. Oh, that was an inhale. <laughs> let's take a big inhale. And then an exhale. What I love to share with you today is I watched an animated movie on Netflix called the summit of the gods and the reason why i want to discuss this movie a, a part of it is at this time of year I, i'm receiving uh, a lot of messages and emails from people first of all thank you all for emailing me it, it touches my heart that you all feel so connected to what i've been sharing to the podcast to this community that you are reaching out to me and sharing with me your experiences, your your triumphs and tragedies, your pain and promises. And a lot of people, a lot of the messages, I should say, a lot of the messages I've received as of late um, are people experiencing a lot of loss, a lot of pain, a lot of despair and grief. And what I'm noticing is, especially in the, in the grief part, where there's been a lot of loss, a lot of transitions, where people are getting a divorce, they're losing their homes, their house, their, their family, their routine, their structure, their finances, losing their health. And it could feel like You've lost everything. There's nothing left. C completely depleted. Emptied out. Like there's just not another like piece of fluid that could be wrung from the cloth. Just exhausted and drained. And the truth is, that's a belief. And, and this is not to diminish anything that anyone is going through. But the fact that you might have your arms, your legs, your, your vision, there's, there are parts of you that are still left. Parts of your life that are still intact. Even if 80 or 90% of it is gone. You know, I've had my wages garnished before. That was, and that was 99, like the IRS came in and took 99% of what I was making. And they not only took it out my checks, they took it out my bank accounts. You know, I was living out my car for three years. I was living in my car for three years. I was evicted. I had pennies in the bank. I, actually, I was overdrawn all the time. This was at the time when banks were, you know, those crazy charges of $35 uh, for an overdraft fee. And, and then they would charge you for having, there was a fee for having and being overcharged. I mean, it was fee on top of fee and, and it caused a lot of poverty. A lot of people struggled. I was at the money check cashing place all the time. And, and on top of that, I had to have surgery on my neck. I, I was paralyzed twice. And the second time it required surgery. 
at which time I had no money to to get the the, the spinal surgery. My C three through five had to be fused together. I was single. I was I was living in L.A. and I had some friends out here, and uh, it was tough. It was lonely. It was a, it was financially it felt like undoable. And all I knew was that I had to keep going. I just I had to just those three inches in front of my eyes. How do I whether that meant calling a friend, asking for help, crying, going for a walk, taking a job. Sometimes it's when we feel like we've lost everything that we can build on everything. Case in point, there's this movie, Mully, and I know you guys are like, I thought you were talking about Summit of Gods. <laughs> there's a there's a documentary, I'm going to get back to the Summit of Gods. Uh, there's a documentary called Mully on Prime, and it's about this true story, about this kid in Kenya, 10 years old, wakes up and his family is gone. His mom, his dad, two siblings. They've, they've just left him in a hut in Kenya. He's 10. He goes to his uncle and his uncle beats him away. Get out of here. I'm not, I'm not feeding you. Figure it out. And so for the next 10 years, he is living on the streets with hundreds and thousands of other kids who are also living on the streets in Kenya. And finally, he reaches a point where he wants to end his life. He's looking at a river. And he says, I hate my life the way it is. And I can't imagine it getting better throwing myself in this in these raging waters seems to be the only solution and out the blue some stranger he talks to tells him come with me to church now for you listeners out there you know I'm not a religious guy I'm I believe in a higher power, but you know, I, I, my mom would send me to church and I would skip it or <laughs> I would, yeah, I would, I would skip it. I would go play video games or I would go to church and then hang out. Our church had a basketball court <laughs> and I would just hang out on a basketball court. It was an indoor basketball court and, or I would hang out in the bathroom. I don't know what I did in the bathroom when I look back, but I would spend just a lot of time in the bathroom as a kid. Maybe I took books with me or, or something, but I don't remember what I did. I just sat there. My imagination was so wild. I could be anywhere and entertain myself. But anyway, so Mully with, you know, in a place where he feels like he has no options, nowhere to go, he, he entertains the guy's invitation and, and goes to church and in a church. The pastor is talking about work, and if if you work for it, God will work for you. And Mully took that to heart, so he said, "Okay, I got to get a job. I have to get to work." And so he goes into the richest neighborhoods, and he starts banging on all the doors, asking for work. Now, mind you, he's been living on the streets. So he has no shirt, no shoes, no hat, had, probably hasn't showered, no, hasn't brushed his teeth, nothing. But he's banging on the richest doors in Kenya. 
Kenya asking for work. And finally, a lady lets him in, lets him clean the house for a few months, and then lets him work out in the fields for a few months, and then promotes him to manager of like 800 employees. I think it was 800 field workers or 300. It was, it was in the hundreds. He starts making money, starts saving money, and then buys a bus so he can transport workers. And so he starts his own busing company where he starts saving money that he made from the first bus and starts buying other buses and then has to hire people to drive those buses. And then he starts an insurance company. And then this company had like 20 or 30 businesses. And then he got into, somehow got into oil and I forget what else. Anyway, here's a kid who abandoned completely by his parents at 10, living on the streets for another 10 years. So that brings him up to about 20. And now is a millionaire. And the story should end there. And I'm not going to tell you more about the story because that's that all happens like in the first 20 minutes of this documentary. It's really a remarkable story. Um. No, but actually, I have to tell you the the this other part. So he works, becomes a millionaire, and then he gets uh, his car gets stolen. Some kids on the street, like how he was a kid on the street. Here's what's funny about life: how people talk about how life goes full circle. No, life goes in uh, a figure eight. Like it, it's like DNA. Like it. it it keeps circling back and through and <clears throat> you know, you'll learn these different lessons and hopefully you'll get a closed loop where you finally learn the lesson and, and then you, you kind of get that closure that you were looking for. His car gets stolen by some kids who are living on a street because Mully would not give them money. These kids asked him for money and he's like, I'm not, giving you anything go get a job the same way I got a job and so they steal his car and so he has to take the bus home one of his buses that he owns and he's trying to figure out why did this happen to me and then he's asking himself why didn't I just give those kids money why all I had to do was give them a few bucks I understood the position they were in and I understood that they weren't they didn't want to be there why didn't I give them money? And why did this happen to me? And finally he realizes it was God's way of saying, okay, you've made money. You're comfortable. Now I need you to be of service and help these kids. So this, so Mully, who was a millionaire and married with seven children, seven children, comes home and tells his wife, I'm selling everything. I'm selling everything. I'm, I'm, I'm ending all businesses. So we won't have any more money coming in. And we're going to start taking in the kids from the street. And they do. And he, he brings home three kids and then five kids and then 10. Remember, he already has seven kids of his own. And it gets to a point where he now has upwards about of a thousand kids living on his property. And so of course they have to expand it and buy more land and all of this and money is tight and they, they get to a point where they're almost out of food, out of money because remember he stopped working, he ended all his businesses. Uh, and so there was no residual income. He didn't have like online companies then the donations start coming in people start donating food they're donating money they're donating resources he figures out how to live off the land so now uh, instead of them having to really need all the the food and money they're able to grow their own food so they're eating what they're growing and so now he's 
found a, a he's created a new wealth for himself, a wealth of family, because because he's helped over a thousand kids, who by the way, um, because they set up schools on the premises, they're graduating college, they're going to college, they're getting jobs, and then they're coming back and working for his foundation to help other kids. My point is, is if you're in a place right now where you feel like you've lost it all, or you feel like you're losing it all, that may very well be the case. It could also be the case that you're losing it all and you've lost it all so that you can receive it all. So that you can receive the love of a thousand kids. So that you can receive the, the love of family and friends and future generations. To get that soul love, that spiritual love. Whereas maybe before there was a material love. And I know not everybody um, you know, is walking around with a million dollars or gr- grow up in a household with that. But sometimes in life, we have to lose everything that we have in order to get the things that we really need. And that space in between is going to be challenging, painful, lonely, scary. There's a a word called kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. And kenosis comes from, it's a spiritual term. And it means self-emptying of, of Jesus' own will and being, <clears throat> of Jesus' own will and being entirely receptive to God's divine will. And basically what that means, what kenosis basically is, is that we have to give in order to receive. Now, what's interesting is if the universe if God, if whatever's out there is trying to give you something, but we, for whatever reason, are unaware of it. And so we're not giving anything. We're not, we're not making any space for it. Then circumstances will happen to force it out of us. The other night I had food poisoning. And in order for my body to heal itself, to repair itself, to strengthen itself, it had to expel everything that was poisonous. And along with that, things that weren't poisonous, it just got caught up in the momentum, in the, in the rapture. And so that was collateral damage. So sometimes in the process of, but, but I had to go through that so my body could heal itself. So right now in this place where if if you've lost your job, right, you lost your, your wife, your routine, the kids, finances, health, that, that, just feels like you're vomiting everything that you have and it's painful. Your stomach hurts and it feels like you're going to die. And you're like, if this goes on, I, I don't, I don't want to be here. And that's how I felt with the food poisoning. The, the, the pain in my stomach was so violent and turbulent. I was like, I don't know how much longer I could live with this. And then because I allowed myself to vomit and and not that I was like vomit now, my body was like, we're going to do this. We, you could have stuck your fingers down your throat a long time ago, 
But since you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. And sometimes life is like that. Life is like, if you're not going to get rid of these things that don't really serve your bigger purpose, your bigger mission, we're going to, we're going to evict you. We're going to uh, have you living out your car. We're, we're going to take your, a part of your health away. We're going to remove you from your family. We're going to do it for you. So some of us have to go through this state of kenosis, this self-emptying. And if we're lucky, we empty ourselves. This is why a lot of people practice fasting. It's a way of emptying ourselves to make room so that we can be receptive for the things that can heal us. But if we don't practice that self-emptying, that, that kenosis, then life is going to find a way to, to do it for us. And so you might be in a state of, I don't know what the opposite of kenosis is, like when, when you know, kenosis is self-emptying, and I don't know what something, um, it, something forcing you to empty would be. So some of you may be in that space. Or if you just feel like everything's being taken away from you, you're losing everything. You don't have any agency or autonomy. It's like you're losing control over everything. You don't have a say in what's happening right now. The ship is, is, uh, you're no longer the captain of the ship. It's almost like... uh, not capsized, but I forget I forget what it's called when pirates take over a ship. Coming back to the summit of the gods. Oh, you thought I forgot about that, didn't you? Oh, no, I did not. When we're going through the state of kenosis, state of loss, state of pain and grief, when Life just feels heavy. And we're like, why me? That's that's such a dangerous question. Why me? Why now? Why this? It's dangerous. And in in the summit of God's, it says there doesn't need to be a reason. There doesn't need to be a reason for why what's happening is happening to you. Now, Mully, Mully found a reason. He, his reason why his car was stolen was that he needed to realize that his riches weren't enough. Yes, he was rich, but what sense was it that he was rich in a land of poverty? But for some people, there doesn't need to be a reason. For some, the mountains are a goal, aren't a goal, but a path. And this is for us who have achieved a lot, have accomplished a lot, and are like, but what's the purpose? What's the reason? What's the point of me doing all this? And the reason is, is because it's not about getting to the summit. It's it's not that that you you realize that the accomplishments and the achievements, um, that really wasn't the goal. It was just a path. It was just about the, it was just a, a, a part of your journey. Because once you achieve a goal or some accomplishment, you realize all that's left is to keep going. And that's what I re- want to remind you of. That when, at the end of the day, no matter what you've done, how many how many A's in class you've gotten or trophies you have on your wall or, or uh, people you've been with or countries you've traveled to or what kind of shape you're in or how many push-ups you did or books that you've read or people that you've met or 
whatever you've achieved or done in your life, all that's left is to keep going, whatever that means. Sometimes keep going means to sell everything, to get rid of your material possessions. Sometimes that means quitting your job. Sometimes that means getting a job. Sometimes that that means getting a divorce. Sometimes it means getting married. What do you need? Look at where you are right now at this moment, not where you've been, where you are right now. And what do you need to keep going? you very well might have to go through a state of kenosis. And if you don't know the answer to that, you can write that down on a piece of paper and meditate on it. Or just, you know, write on a piece of paper and tuck that up under your pillow. What do I need to keep going at this at this moment? Don't, don't try to figure out the next 10 years or 20 years or 30, what do I need to keep going? Maybe I need to go for a walk. Bake bread. Take a nap. Maybe I need to in, invest in myself, in my company, in my business. But there's some area that you can explore, that you can venture into, where you will experience such a feeling of aliveness, it could very well be overwhelming and scary because it's so unfamiliar to you. All that's left is to keep going. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. Remember, this podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help. Call the 1-800-SUICIDE, 1-800-273-TALKS, You can go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Together.